<clears throat> Good morning. Open your Bibles to the Gospel of Mark. <clears throat> Mark chapter 3. <clears throat> Thankful for Jack uh, taking a turn in the pulpit last week. Um, also thankful to be back and able to preach today. Um, <clears throat> we have a meal today, which means I get to preach longer, and I didn't get to preach last week, which means I get to preach longer. And Stephen uh, Seeley is visiting um, another uh, co-worker from CIT being honored today at another local church, and so we can't, you know, start, we can't finish till he gets back. So that's another thing, too. So it depends how long their service goes um, and all of that. <clears throat> anyway, um, no, all that to say, I, I'm very thankful to, to be here. Um, the Lord has uh, wrestled with me in this text. Um, and I'm excited to bring it before you today on this Palm Sunday. Lord willing, we will look at the parable of the sower next week for Easter morning. And let me invite you again to our Sun Rose service at 8.30 next week because Jesus rose from the dead and it was past tense, risen. He wasn't there, right, when they came. So we're doing it at 8.30 and that will be outside, by the way. Um, so depending on, you know, it'll probably be 70 degrees next week, even though it's 32 this morning. But uh, dress appropriately, looking forward. That's always a sweet time of year. And I'm really enjoying this season uh, <clears throat> through Holy Week uh, because last year we had a baby. And uh, so Easter was very different for us last year, but I'm excited to just be with you and with Isla now turning one years old this Easter. Um, it's, it's a wonderful time of year. So um, anyways, Mark chapter 3, um, I'll invite you to stand one more time out of reverence and respect for God's word. We'll read Mark chapter 3 beginning in verse 20. Mark chapter 3, verse 20. Thus saith the Lord. <clears throat> then he went home, and the crowd gathered again, so that they could not even eat. And when his family heard it, they went out to seize him, for they were saying, He is out of his mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying, He is possessed by Beelzebul, and the prince of demons or by the prince of demons, he cast out the demons. And he called to him, called them to him and said to them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but is coming to an end. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man. Then indeed he may plunder his house. Truly I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the children of man, whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they were saying, he has an unclean spirit. And his mother and his brothers came, and standing outside, they sent to him and called to him. And a crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. And he answered them, Who are my mother and my brothers? Looking about at those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. This is God's word. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> well, at this point in the book of Mark, it's important to remember where we are. Jesus has made quite a scene so far in three chapters. You know, of course, Jesus has been healing a lot of people, which is plenty enough to stir up a crowd and to draw attention to yourself. But he's also been doing stuff on the Sabbath and having direct uh, uh, pointed contradiction uh, arguments, disputes with the Pharisees and the religious leaders, which will also cause a scene. That got people's attention. But then another thing, right before Mark gives the commission of the disciples, which Pastor Jack preached for us last week, uh, it says that in verse 11, 
whenever the unclean spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God. So we also see the wrestling of cosmic powers between Jesus and darkness. And that's helpful context as we lead into this passage because locals may have been tempted to misunderstand what was happening here when demons are bowing down to Jesus. And he says, y'all pipe down and don't tell people, right? Um, what's going on there? We know Jesus, and we read him as the hero, so we don't question it too quickly, right? We have no problems here. We see the demons surrendering, bowing down to Jesus because he's Jesus. They're powerless to his authority. Makes sense, right? He makes them look weak. He makes them flee. But if you were just conniving enough, and you took Jesus to be a troublemaker, you might just be tempted to believe that all these unclean spirits obeying him might mean something else entirely. It might just mean that he is their leader. And that, of course, would be the worst error and sin that any human being is capable of committing, which is what we learn today in this text. All of us must decide for ourselves what kind of person Jesus is. Jesus said to Peter in Matthew 16, some you know, say this, some say that. Who, who do you say that I am? You might know C.S. Lewis wrote a book called Mere Christianity. And in that book, which I'd highly recommend, if anybody will read it, it's in my office, you can go have it after service if you promise to read it. Um, he writes in that book, I am trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral, moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with a man who says he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the Son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come away with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. Now it seems to me obvious that he was, either, he was neither a lunatic nor a fiend, and consequently, however strange or terrifying or unlikely it may seem, I have to accept the view that he was and is God. This is precisely Mark's intent in recording this gospel story. Jesus was and is God. Well, what if his family said otherwise? That's not a very good argument for the gospel, is it? To have, you know, if they were going to uh, make this whole thing up, I would have probably left that part out. Where Jesus' family that knew him better than anybody else called him a madman? It's not selling it too good, is it? What if his family calls him crazy? Who cares what the family says? What do you say? Well, what if the Pope or some religious guru on YouTube says that he is just like all the other gods? Or that he is a demon, unclean spirit? Who do you say that he is? We're challenged with this text to make sure that we get Jesus right. And just as Jesus was accused of all kinds of falsehoods, so we will be charged falsely if we follow him. We may lose relationships with our family members. We may get into all kinds of trouble and difficulty for following him. But we have tasted the power of the gospel that washes our sins away and ushers us in to a new family that Jesus bought with his own blood. We may well be, calls, be called fools, madmen, lunatics for believing that he is the Son of God. We may be forsaken by those we thought that loved us, but we can take courage knowing our sins are forgiven in heaven and Jesus is not ashamed to call us brothers. And that's what this text is about. Three points for us this morning to help you follow along. Accusation, blasphemy, and family. Accusation, blasphemy, and family. 
starting in verse 20. Then he went home, which we take to be Capernaum there where uh, Peter was from, and the crowd gathered again so that they could not even eat. And when his family heard it, they went out to seize him, for they were saying, he is out of his mind. So how do you know Jesus was fully man? Because he got hungry. That's one, one reason, right? He goes home to get something to eat after he commissions his disciples out on top of the mountain. Um, and Jesus in the Gospels like never gets to eat. You know, it's no surprise that when he goes to Levi's house, he's like, please make me something to eat, right? And they eat. The only way he can get a sandwich is if he goes to a tax collector's house. Um, and he goes back to Peter's house uh, where his mother-in-law was, and all the crowds are gathering in on him again, just like they did when the man came through the roof, remember, not long ago? And they couldn't even eat. And while I've got you hungry thinking about food, and we have a dinner today, this passage is what we call a Markin sandwich. It's what the, the theology nerds would call it, right? Because Mark does this a lot, where you've got this theme and this theme, which seem to be related, and this thing in the middle that's like, is this related? What's because you got his family seeking him, and then the whole thing about blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, and then the family get there, and he's like, No, these are my family, right? So, what's this part in the middle? Mark is saying this is connected, and he's going to show us how it's connected. Um, they're not unrelated in Mark's agenda, they'll help us actually interpret what's going on with the family in a moment. Um, but the basic point is that the people who should be supporting him are actually denying him. They're rejecting him. The people you think would be, you know, if Jesus was going to be king of Israel, he was coming in, his, you know, his own family would be his biggest cheerleaders, and the Jewish religious, religious leaders would be like, yeah, he's the king, let's, let's put him on the throne, you know, and the exact opposite of that is happening. He's being denied by the people who are supposed to being, be supportive of him. And that first group is his own family. They went out to seize him. They were saying he's out of his mind. Jesus' mother, remember, a young girl, Mary, a virgin, who met an angel and conceived of a child who was promised to be the Messiah, to be born in Bethlehem, given to her by the Holy Spirit. And here she is saying, he, he's gone, he's gone bonkers. Mary say that? Don't tell a Catholic, right? Mary said that? That he's, that he's out of his mind? Jesus was not out of his mind. But I think what Mark is trying to show us here from verse 1, remember, of chapter 1, proving from Isaiah and from the prophets that this is the Son of God. And one of those prophecies in the Old Testament, I think you might recognize from the words of Psalm 69. I have become a stranger to my brothers, an alien to my mother's sons. For zeal for your house has consumed me, and the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me. This is also why John begins his gospel in chapter 1, verse 11, saying that he came to his own, Jesus came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. It doesn't just mean the people of Israel, but even his own family did not believe him at first. The very people that Jesus should have had unconditional love and support and acceptance from was, you would think, his own family. But because he was the Son of God, the reproaches of God fell on him. He was like a stranger to his mother's sons. We see that playing itself out here. The accusations, though, get worse. It's, it's one thing to be called a maniac, but now the scribes are saying he's possessed by Beelzebul, by the prince of demons. He casts out demons. And this is the conniving that I was telling you about. A minute ago, they see the demons obey, falling down at Jesus' feet. And the obvious interpretation of that is Jesus is stronger than they are. And they have no choice but to submit to him, right? But they ascribe this as the authority of the devil. The devil. The only way that the demons must be obeying him is because he's their lord. Like their, their master. And Beelzebul, not just from a queen song that we all are familiar with, but... Uh, it means master of the house. Master of the house. And so um, they're saying that Jesus is not only able to cast out these demons because um, they're submitting to him, but because he's their master. This is why they bow down to him. They reject the light of the world 
and exchange him as the prince of darkness. Well, this is a grievous crime, a grievous error to make. They are very wrong. But this is the Savior that we worship on Palm Sunday. Here is the king riding into Jerusalem on a donkey with his feet dragging across the ground, taking the most unexpected, almost paradoxical route toward the throne. The children shout, Hosanna, Savior, Deliverer. He comes in the name of the Lord on the back of a small donkey, never been ridden before. I asked Mariana a question this week um, leading up to Palm Sunday. Why is Palm Sunday such a big deal for churches? Like, you know, I see it all in the, the social media. It's like some churches do Palm Sunday like just as big as Easter. It's like Easter part one, you know, and then Easter is the, the Easter part two, you know. Um, obviously, the text is, is brilliant. It's extravagant. We, we understand there's something amazing happening there. Um, but she, she, she gave a really good answer. I think we love Palm Sunday because we know this is how Jesus should have been treated. There you go. It's a good answer. Um, this is how Jesus should have been treated. Instead, he was called a madman. Instead, he was called a demon or the prince of demons. We're reminded today of Jesus' worth in the irony of his ridicule. Bearing shame and scoffing rude? Is this the Savior? Suddenly, our hosannas become that much richer when we see his glory in the nature of his poverty. We also remember today that this is our king. He was accused as a lunatic by his own family, called Satan by the religious leaders. How should we expect to be treated as followers of this king? This is our king. What's going to happen to us if we follow him? I almost had us read Matthew 10 today for our scripture reading, um, which has a lot of overlap here. Jesus says in Matthew 10, verse 24, A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for the disciple to be like his teacher and the servant like his master. If they've called the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign those of his household? Have you been maligned because you belong to the Savior's household? Jesus is not against families, but he says that his gospel will divide families. It will turn um, man against father, daughter against mother, daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. The person's enemies, it says also in Matthew 10, will be those in his own household. That's crazy. That text is really hard for us to stomach. It's hard for me to stomach in a lot of ways. But the reality is many may call us crazy for following Jesus. Many may even call us evil for following Jesus. They might even be people we lived with. They were people that Jesus lived with. We should not expect a greater kindness from the world than they gave to Jesus. Perhaps some of you are in a situation like that today. Some of you, you know, or some think you look more like Satan than like a shining light before men. Maybe family members avoid you or speak badly of you because of your commitment to the truth. You can take courage because you are following in the footsteps of the king. We'll see toward the end of this passage that as hard as it is to be maligned by the people closest to us, that is a far greater treasure to belong to the family of God and be maligned than to belong to the world without problems and not know this king. I feel, as I've been meditating on this myself, that I haven't been maligned in a while. And I thought, you know, that's, that's nice. <laughs> it feels like a blessing to not have people slander me or speak ill of my reputation or just say things that aren't true. That hasn't happened in a while, and it's kind of nice. You probably would say the same, I hope. But Jesus says it's the exact opposite. 
it is a blessing to be persecuted for righteousness' sake. And so we flip it on our heads and say, maybe I'm not being public enough with my devotion to Jesus that I'm not being maligned. And that's just something we all have to work out in our own family and those who we are close to. <clears throat> Jesus answers their, them with a correction. He says, how can Satan cast out Satan? It's a good question, right? You guys want to use logic? Let's use, let's use logic. How can Satan cast out Satan? If I was Satan, wouldn't I be working against myself? If this is what's happening, does that mean that Satan's kingdom is divided? Does that mean Satan's kingdom is crumbling to nothing? It's falling from within? And he, he's running a terrible kingdom, casting out his own people, right? Into pigs. The logical conclusion that you're going to come to is that Satan is fighting against himself like a schizophrenic. He's, he's casting out his own soldiers. And if that's the case, and his kingdom is coming to an end, you guys should be kind of happy that that's happening, right? And not you should be like, all right, Satan doesn't know what he's doing. This is awesome. He's casting out demons. But you guys are calling it, you, you're, the logic is not adding up. Satan would be against himself if that was the case. But that's clearly not what's happening here. Jesus tells a parable about what is happening here. How can anyone enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds that strong man? And then he will have the freedom to go in and plunder his home. If he wants to take over the house, he's got to take out the head honcho. He's got to take out the big guy, the, the person who lives there. Jesus is saying that the strong man is the devil. And he has come into these people's lives and has tied Satan to a chair in the closet with duct tape over his mouth. That's how he casts out the demons. That's how he's plundering the unclean spirits from these host people who were possessed because Satan is bound up. That's what's happening here. This is my house now. Satan is done. I'm stronger than Satan. That's why they're fleeing. Because I'm plundering his work. Can you imagine the crime then it would be to call the guy who just beat up the strong man the loser? This is a great mistake. Jesus has bound Satan. You hear that? Jesus has bound Satan. There is nothing that he can do without Jesus' permission. And they call Jesus Beelzebul. They have perverted the glory of he who comes in the name of the Lord. And so Jesus takes the next couple of verses to explain the gravity of their error and just how serious it is for them to make such an accusation. This is nothing to be taken lightly. So blasphemy is what he says in verse 28. Look at verse 28. Truly I say to you, all sins will be forgiven, the children of man, whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they were saying he has an unclean spirit. Any of you, for any portion of your life, been like scared to death of this verse? You want to just admit that, Right? Many of us have been traumatized by this verse. Um, and I hope to give you some relief today. We might have felt terror in our soul or paranoia that we have committed the unforgivable sin. And that'd be the worst, wouldn't it? To do that one thing that Jesus just won't forgive or can't forgive. Man, that you're in a bad way. If you've done that one thing, and you're, I mean, it's too late. No matter what happens now, you know, you, if you live 100 more years, Jesus ain't going to save you. You, you did the thing. It's too late. And um, we've heard many bad sermons, um, manipulative preaching. But we preach the Bible in context, and we do that because that's how God gave it to us. So much of the controversy over this 
Scripture has come because of what I call one verse theology. That's where you take one verse and you just rip it out of the Bible and you develop an entire doctrine and framework and system and worldview around it. And that's not a good thing to do because you're going to get in all kinds of danger. Um, how many of you have heard something like this? The unforgivable sin is to blaspheme against the Holy Spirit. And if you do that, you're out. If you're a Christian, though, you'll never do that because you're a Christian. Christians don't do that. You can't blaspheme against the Holy Spirit. He lives in you. So Christians don't blaspheme the Holy Spirit. And if you're a Christian, then you're good to do it. You, you can't commit the unforgivable sin. I think we've heard a, a lot of teaching that sounds something like that when we try to explain this verse. The only problem with that is the rest of the chapter. They just called Jesus Beelzebul. Not only that, but Jesus gives the most glorious caveat in verse 28 before verse 29, which says, truly, if you're going to listen, listen to this, truly, all sins, all sins will be forgiven. The children of man, whatever blasphemies they utter, all sins will be forgiven, whatever blasphemy. Do you hear that? That's good news. That all sins will be forgiven. All blasphemies that they utter for those who are in Christ. How many sins does Jesus forgive? All of them. What about blasphemy? Whatever blasphemies they utter. You can't possibly think up a sin that Jesus cannot forgive. You can't do it. We preach that every Sunday until we get to this verse. Well, except for that one, right? No! Jesus can forgive anything because he's Jesus. He binds the strong man. There is no sin that Jesus can't forgive. You hear that silly question? You know, can God make a rock that's too heavy for him to lift? What a silly thing to propose. Can God convict us of a sin that he can't forgive? Of course not. Of course not. So what's going on here? Whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit, Jesus says, never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. What on earth does that mean? Mark tells us, for they were saying he has an unclean spirit. Look at the verse before it. Look at the verse after it. Mark is trying to help us understand it. Did he, say, he said that? Because they were saying he has an unclean spirit. The word blasphemy means to slander, to call something good bad, or to call something bad good. It is to say whatever God says is truth is false. It's to do whatever God, the opposite of whatever God says is true, right? That is blasphemy. And um, God has testified that Jesus is his son, that Jesus is truth, that Jesus is the Word made flesh, his beloved Son with whom he is well pleased. And at his baptism, the Holy Spirit of God rested on him and remained on him. To attribute the glory of the Son to the mockery of the serpent is to show yourself condemned. It is to prove to the whole world and give evidence that you are guilty. You do not know the Savior. You must repent and believe in Christ as Lord because you are very wrong. This is the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Any of you ever called Jesus Beelzebul? If you, if you want to take the previous interpretation, at least you haven't done that. You're, <laughs> right? If you, if you haven't called Jesus Beelzebul, at least you haven't done that. You haven't committed this unforgivable sin thing. Um, but, but they were not just ignorant. They, they were not just blind. They were guilty. They were unrepentant. They were casting stones at the only way to be saved. So if you cross out Jesus over here as the only way to salvation, where else can you go? You've made an, a choice of eternal consequence. 
to look away from the one way of salvation and go any other direction. There is no salvation in any other name given under heaven among men by which we must be saved. Jesus is the one mediator between man and God. And if you rule him out, hopeless, hopeless. If you would take him to be a demon, there is eternal judgment to face. There is eternal consequence to bear. There is eternal guilt that must be punished. This passage is indeed a warning. If we get Jesus wrong, we get everything wrong. We may be guilty of an eternal sin if we misunderstand Jesus. Is he a lunatic? Is he demonic? Or is he king? All life and death, heaven and hell, relies upon the answer to that question. Who is he? But on the other end of the spectrum, if calling Jesus Beelzebul leads to eternal death, what must it mean for us who call upon him as Lord? To call him a demon, to turn away from him, eternal guilt, to turn toward him, must mean our eternal reward, eternal life, eternal blessing, eternal salvation through the one way, truth, and life that was given to us. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified. With the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Beloved, Jesus can forgive all sins. Whatever blasphemies you utter. He can do it. But you must call him Lord. You must believe in your heart, in his death and his resurrection, as the one way to reconcile our broken relationship with God. There is no other way. Do you know how Jesus intends to wash our sins away? This is the miracle of Easter. This is the paradox of the triumphal entry. Jesus came to bind the strong man. Who's the strong man? Satan, right? Master of the house, Beelzebul. That's the strong man. How does Jesus defeat him? He says he ties him up. He binds him. Well, how does he do that? What in the world does that mean in the spiritual realm? That means he would be treated as though he were Beelzebul. Jesus bound him by being treated as if he was a demon. Jesus defeated Satan by taking the mockery of the cross and curse of sin upon himself. This is how Jesus washes away sins. This is how Jesus saves sinners. He binds a strong man by taking our sins in his own body. He binds Satan by binding himself to the cross of crucifixion. He binds the devil by being crushed under the full weight of God's wrath in order to crush his head. He bruises his heel. He washes away sins by becoming sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God. He washes away our sins with his blood. Lay aside the garments that are stained with sin and be washed in the blood of the Lamb. There's a fountain flowing for the soul unclean. Oh, be washed in the blood of the Lamb. He is stronger than the strong man and yet was treated like the greatest sinner who ever lived. And he did that 
so he could call us brothers, so he could call us family. Stephen back yet? Is your dad back yet? Don't know. We still got time then. All right, y'all want to do one more point? One more point? 32 minutes? Let's do it. All right, here we go. Verse 31. His mother and his brothers came, and standing outside, they sent to him and called him, and a crowd was sitting around him. And they said to him, Your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. And he answered them, Who are my mother and my brothers? Looking about at those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. So they finally made it, his family did, to Capernaum. And they arrive on the scene and they're outside the home. Everybody else is inside the home. There's a great crowd. They're looking for Jesus. And already Mark is sort of painting this dividing line. Here's the people inside sitting at Jesus' feet. Here's the people outside that don't know where he is. Just let that sit. His family's on the outside of the house. Everybody else is inside. They know Jesus. His family, his blood family, is outside. They don't know where he's at. But word gets inside the home that Jesus' mother and his brothers are outside looking for him. And we should not be surprised when Jesus responds to a question by asking another epic question, which is what he does here. Your mother and brothers are outside. He says, who are my mother and my brothers? Who are my mother and my brothers? Does Jesus not know who they are? Maybe he is out of his mind. Did he forget who Mary was for all this time? Did he forget who his brothers were? No, of course not. Jesus is setting them up to leave behind an earthly perspective of family and enter into this paradigm of a heavenly family. Jesus is not saying he doesn't have a mother and brothers. He's saying that there is a spiritual family far more important than his blood-related family. His blood-related family is not unimportant, but just as Jesus redefines the Sabbath by his own authority, he has the ability and power and authority to redefine family. Isn't that interesting? Who are my family, he says. And then he scans the room. He looks at everybody who is sitting around, listening to him, talking with him, being with him. Here are my mother, my brothers, my sisters. For whoever do, does the will of God he is my brother and sister and mother. Who is your family, Main Street? It goes without saying that there are three people in this congregation that I love more than the rest. Can you guess who they are? Yeah, y'all can. And I, no shame, I love them more than y'all. <laughs> right? Um, you should fire me if I didn't. I love him more. And yet at the same time, Jesus is saying that the relationship we share as the people of God is actually deeper than that of husband and wife, parent and child, brother and sister. Jesus has a completely different criteria for thinking through who belongs to who. It's not about whether or not we share the last name. Jesus says that true family are those who are heirs with Christ. Ephesians says we've been adopted into this new heavenly family. We've been given an inheritance from God. And the Holy Spirit has come as this down payment for that inheritance. And all believers share this Holy Spirit. He dwells in each of us. And this is the blessed tie that binds our hearts in Christian unity. It's stronger than blood. True family are also those who are not ashamed of you. Jesus says, his family was outside thinking they needed to rescue him. They were ashamed because of his actions and all the trouble he's gotten into over in uh, uh, Capernaum. And Jesus says, they aren't my family. These people sitting next to me calling me Lord are my family. They're not embarrassed by my words. Luke 9 says, whoever is ashamed of me and my words of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory and the glory of the, uh, of the Father and of the holy angels. 
Our family might be disappointed in us. We might have had fathers who never said, I'm proud of you. We might have children who are embarrassed of us and generally don't enjoy spending time with us, particularly the older we get. We might have siblings who we never even talk to. But in the family of God, no one is put to shame. We sit together, not ashamed of one another. We eat together, we live life together. We're not ashamed of one another. And then finally, Jesus is saying that true family are those who do the will of God. True Christian family is not based on blood, last name, proximity, or sharing a house. It is not enough to say we are family. Jesus says that true family acts like family. They do the will of God together. Of course, uh, you also know those, maybe the second scariest verse in the Bible. It's Matthew 7. Not all who call on him, Lord, Lord, in that day will inherit the kingdom of God. They'll say, I never knew you. Why? Because they, uh, not all, they did not do the will of my Father in heaven, Jesus says. They called him Lord, but did not do the Father's will. <clears throat> Our actions communicate who we belong to. I love our church, right? I hope you love our church. Um, from what I hear among other pastors, I genuinely believe we have something rare here. You know, I don't feel like I have a job that you guys pay me to do. I feel like I have a family. I, mean, I really feel that way. And I've tried to make that my priority since day one, that this is church ought to be family, you know? We had a couple missionaries visiting with us a couple weeks ago, and they wrote me an email one Sunday. After 30 years of ministry, this may be the most friendly and welcoming and kind church they've ever visited. How on earth does that happen? How? I, I can't explain it other than that God did it. How is this little gathering of 50 people in the middle of no, nowhere, North Carolina, displaying a kind of unforgettable love and affection that leaves marks on people? Maybe we took this distinction seriously that there is people inside the home and people outside. And the people inside are the ones who know one another, who are not ashamed of one another, who do the will of God together. We must protect it. Continue loving one another deeply. I'd encourage you to just scan the room right now. If Jesus were to ask you, who is your family? Would you look around? Say, so here we are. This is it. This is my family. Here are my mother and my brother. I, this, this is it. We love our families. I love my family. You love your family. But the reality is, and many of you have experienced the heartache of loss. Family doesn't last forever. The nuclear family. We lost Ruby this week, didn't we? And you know, before that, she lost two husbands. Can you imagine the heartache of losing a husband, a spouse? Children grow up, parents pass away, siblings move. The, the family that we want to keep forever and hold so tightly to doesn't last. It's not permanent. And I think that God has given us this nuclear family, marriage, parents, children, siblings, to give us a taste for an eternal family that will never perish. A family that lives forever and is together for the right reasons. 
and never has drama or conflict at Thanksgiving, but loves one another selflessly, unconditionally, and for the glory of Christ. We want that. And even the best, most perfect, well-rounded, holy, loving nuclear family on earth is but a foretaste of the true desire of our hearts. And I'll, I'll end with this. One more thought. I promise. I've let the cat out of the bag. I don't have any tattoos. <laughs> Where am I going with this? I don't have any tattoos. <clears throat> Not because I'm against tattoos. But um, it's got to be something I really, 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 really want. Right? And the greatest temptation I've had to get a tattoo is to get my wife's handwriting on me. I love you. And then to get Isla's handwriting on me. I love you. And then to get Tilly's handwriting on me. I love you. Why do I want that? Because I don't want this thing to end. And I was thinking about that this week, one night when I was rocking Tilly, and it just hit me. Jesus has permanently chosen us in his family. He says, here is my mother. Here is my brother. Here is my sisters. This is my family. And what Jesus says, it's done. Isaiah 49, verse 16, the Lord says, Behold, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. We have been sealed on the very palms of Jesus in an irreversible manner. This is family that lasts forever. But in order to be a part of this family, we have to first ask ourselves, who is Jesus? Is he a lunatic? Is he a demon? Or is he God in the flesh? Only one of those answers will make you family. Will you be a part of the family of God? Who do you say that he is? Let's pray. Father, thank you for the gift of your word that challenges us and gives us an eternal perspective. Thank you for the forgiveness of sins, the power of the gospel that makes us new people and also gives us new relationships, gives us a glorious church to be a part of forever, a church that will never perish, a family that will never die. And so God, I pray that you'd help us to live out our true nature as the chosen ones of Jesus' family. I pray, Father, for any who may not know you, who are struggling with this idea of blasphemy or what it means to, to turn away from you or turn, to turn to you. Oh, Lord, I pray that they would run to your arms today. Any who are struggling with um, feeling alone, the feeling that their family has forgotten them, feeling that they've been maligned by the world for following this king, I pray that they would consider it a blessing to follow in the footsteps of Jesus. Help us all to do that well as we sing now. In Jesus' name, amen.